Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. 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 Thanks, everyone, for joining today. We are excited to be here to talk about kids and safety. My name is Kelly Johnson. I'm the country manager of ESET Australia. Um, I'm here today with Jake Moore, who's ESET's global security advisor, and it's very early your time. We really appreciate you joining us. You probably have a okay. big mug of coffee. I'm on my second coffee. I got up at 5.30. Uh, it's all good. I love the morning. It's all good. We're on polar opposite sides of the earth, Sydney <laughs> yeah. to the UK. So so thanks for joining, Jake. If you want to introduce yourself to the, to the, uh, to the session, that would be amazing. Sure. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, I've been with ESET for four years and my job is to teach people about how to stay safe online, whether that be uh, employees, uh, the C-suite of a business, right the way through parents and kids as well. Um, my history before ESET was in the police force uh, on the south coast of England in Dorset Police. I spent well, 14 years with them. Uh, 10 of those years I spent investigating computer crime in the digital forensics department and cybercrime team. So there's nothing I haven't ever seen or investigated. Um, but the most wonderful part of my job from then and now is I still get to help people and advise them on the whole mystery about cybercrime and cybersecurity. So hopefully you're going to learn a hell of a lot today. Very good. So today what we'd like to do is share with you guys some findings. Uh, that we've had from a survey that we took in Australia with kids ages 6 to 13. So we'll present some of these uh, findings that we had, and then we'll go into some recommendations on how we as parents, teachers, carers can navigate this digital world uh, with our kids. And to kick off um, our presentation, we'd like to uh, share with you a video um, and we'd like to um, tune into one of our progress protected uh, thought leaders. Um, and she is going to talk about Mimi Ito is an anthropologist. She's going to talk about uh, kids and technology because it's a little bit more complex, complex than we're, we're giving credit to. Just share my screen here. There are four here. of these ads out there. Um, you can check them out on YouTube. Uh, this is just one of them. Uh, especially in the UK, we've had all four on national TV for the first time ever, which is pretty cool. So check Very it out. Very exciting. Yes. A lot of times I get asked, is technology good or bad for kids? My first struggle is always to reframe that narrative. I think there's an image of children and technology being solitary and antisocial. In fact, the reality is much more complex. Young people latch on to technology as a tool for empowerment and self-expression. This ability to explore new interests, communities, and identities is something that just wasn't available to kids a generation or two ago. The big challenge for us today is how can we ensure that more young people are living in that positive digital future? When technology enables progress, ESET is sure to protect it. ESET Digital Security. Progress protected. Very good. So that's Mimi, and it is a big question for everyone involved. And, um, and so what I'd like to do now is I'll flip over to our... Um, presentation, some, some of the statistics that we found from the survey. The survey that we ran, we, we engaged with about uh, 2,800 kids between the ages of 6 and 13 over a three-month period. And we captured a lot of interesting information, and we're going to share some of those statistics with you now. Um, to start with, um, one of the things is kids' time online. Now, as a mother of five, um, I've got two sets of twins. I've got age from 17 to eight. Um, it's been interesting watching what kids are using, what they're attracted to as far as social media goes. And most kids watch videos and do gaming, which is an active part of most of their lives, you know, what, and also what we've surveyed. Now, not a lot of people can guess what the number one platform is for kids. And so we were really surprised when we got the results in that YouTube, in fact, uh, is the most um, popular social media for kids ages, uh, uh, thir uh, sorry, uh, six to 13. 
Now, they mostly watch videos and play games and so forth. Now, trending more towards the older kids is you'll see more social media, such as uh, Instagram and, and the likes of TikTok and so forth. But children in the, um, you know, platform-wise, they said they were most happy using YouTube, followed by TikTok, and then 71.7% .7 reported themselves as mostly happy online while playing Minecraft and also playing Roblox. And, and I can tell you that that's the fact here in our own house with the kids and what they like to watch and what they like to play and how they social uh, socialize via these games. When you say about being happy as well, this is one thing that gets me. Yeah. My, I've got two kids, right? So they're six and nine. They're not just happy watching YouTube. They love it. They get engrossed and they forget about time, which, you know, I'm, I'm never going to come on to that, but hours can go by and they think it's 10 minutes. They they lose themselves. Yes. And, and it's important that the parental settings are set appropriately, of course, on, on these platforms. So, so in the past 12 months, um, one of these are one of the questions we asked, and we, we really want to know what's happening, right? So when they're online, they're either gaming or otherwise, their experiences of unpleasant behaviors were unfortunately fairly widespread. And what we found was approximately one in three children reported that they experienced nasty or hurtful acts on the internet. Uh, during the past 12 months. Now, a significant number of children also reported being contacted by a stranger online. And most were worried about or they're angry or upset with these types of instances. Now, you know, it's not it's not, you know, necessarily stalking or anything, but there are I even find with my kids, they are socializing with people on games. They don't know who they are. And that's, um, you know, that's against the rules, certainly in our house. So it's mindful to be aware of that. But a relatively high proportion of these kids experience these feelings. It's very concerning, but it's mitigated slightly by the fact that negative emotional response suggests that those children were not naive to the danger, which is a good thing associated with being contacted by a stranger. You know, they're aware that this is somewhat uh, of a risk for them if the settings aren't set properly. So some of the other um information that we gathered when asked kids show that today they're worried about some key threats while they're online and this comes from both a heightened awareness of such threats because of media and news and so on um, and also it's also rather than having them experience them firsthand but their kids have had issues um, kids have had friends that may have had issues that they're worried about for themselves um, I know some of my kids' friends have been cyberbullied, and it's been a big discussion in our house. So there's just that anxiety and worry, the kids that that is out there. And then also being approached by an adult stranger is mainly driven from a gaming and messaging and social interaction. So there's no real way to validate who they're talking to when they're on a public forum within their game. And this is something that needs attention and education from parents and teachers and, and caregivers ensuring that the kids are playing on an age appropriate game and they're only chatting with the friends that they know, right, can really mitigate this risk. So staying safe online. So to offer an encouraging counterpoint to the worries that we just talked about, the study found that despite their valid concerns, 84% of the respondents reported that they were confident and they knew what it takes to avoid online risk. So leaving a relatively low 16% exposed to kind of this uncertainty. Now, clearly the efforts around cybersecurity awareness within Australia, and I know that's been a big focus in schools as well, especially with the homeschooling and, 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 and logging in from home, um, has made an impact. Um, and we also need to remember that because of these lockdowns and homeschooling last year, kids spent a larger amount of time online than usual. Um, but this led to kids feeling more confident. They're using it more, they're more confident, but are they overconfident? Do they think they know, but they don't know? It's a, that's a dangerous place to be. We need to that's actually a that. very good point because whenever I speak to the public, whether they own a company, work somewhere, or they're just uh, in their family, they will always tend to say they are aware of it and they're, or they're confident in what they're doing. And that's a very dangerous place to be. And especially if you're in charge of the family computer right the way through to being in charge of a business and you think you're prepared for attacks or bullying or whatever it might be, that's a very complacent place to be. 
I always say that's actually a bit of a head in the sand moment because that it can is. really cause issues because they're blinkered and they don't take in the the bigger field. That's right. That's right. To, and to deep dive into into settings in the computer and things, they think they're set, but have they really had a look at them lately? Right, especially yeah. with the app updates and so on that go on. Completely, no doubt. So. When we talk about, um, you know, compared to before the coronavirus outbreak, you know, what happened with kids and their mindset around the Internet and so on. So most kids, um, most variables and risk factors impacting the kids' safety online were present to the COVID-19 out, were present prior to the COVID outbreak. And there's no question that the pandemic has exacerbated and accelerated many of these uh, factors. And the risk of increased, um, the increased um, reliance on digital services. So social networks, subscription videos, on-demand streaming, food delivery, online gaming, work from home, online schooling, on and on. The list is, is massive actually, has increased the exposure in children and adults both to both the benefits and the rest of these environments. So, you know, as we just said, parents meanwhile are often navigating similar issues in their own work home environment, leading in some cases to a decrease in parental supervision. And in turn, an increase in the perception that the internet that the internet reported they that the internet they feel that it's unsafe um, from these statistics. So when kids were asked how they perceive the internet now compared to before the outbreak, the result was really interesting. So nearly half of all the kids surveyed reported the internet is now more dangerous or more unpleasant due to the coronavirus. Now, with only five percent saying it was less dangerous or just unpleasant. So this increased perception of danger online was sadly partnered with a growing sense of isolation because you know when you're on your computer and time flat, you're it actually is self-isolating even though you're 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 focused and you're entertained. And um, you know they felt less in touch with their friends and classmates, um, you know, since the outbreak. Now we're back into what we would call our new normal. Kids are back in school. We're out with our mates, um, but we can learn from this that kids who spend a large amount of time online will potentially tend to have an inclination of feeling isolated. So it's just to be aware. So um, education around online safety is constantly required. So I like to say you got to keep going, keep going, keep going. It's like laundry. It's like dishes. It just will always be there. You have to keep it. Keep that going. <laughs> so, so don't ever be complacent and always check in and, and all that type of thing. Same thing with your smoke detectors and whatever else, right? So, in terms of managing this risk and emotions across the three to thirteen age or six to thirteen age bracket, the responses suggest that there's a value in building awareness around the online security, specifically hacking and virus awareness, and as well as uh, obviously online safety. Now, the multi-factor uh, faceted nature of these results would also suggest that the combination of software safeguards, parental controls, and education are effective not only in reducing cybersecurity risk, but also helping kids manage their anxieties about such issues. So even talking to your kids about this, and Jake, you'll highlight some of these tips and tricks, you know, as we go forward, will make them aware, but also help with their anxiety that they, that they may have. Now, the research that we did, um, we've published a white paper. It's on our, on our website on eset.com.au. You guys can check that out. Um, but the research paints a picture of our kids who have a growing awareness of both the risks and benefits, right, that can be found online. It shows that while the pandemic did not necessarily raise any entirely new categories of danger, thank goodness, it did increase the exposure um, while simultaneously diminishing supervision right? Making for a potential mix of risk factors because parents are working, kids are doing their homeschooling and no one's really paying attention. We're kind of out of that now, but I think we're, we've taken a lot of learnings out of this. New types of online socializing, particularly through gaming, meant that rules and ideas around more established social media platforms were often challenged and the lack of physical interaction between kids contributed to a very predictable, but nonetheless distressing increase of feelings of isolation. So, Encouragingly, the data also showed that many kids reported being happy on their online interactions. They're discovering, they're learning, they displayed appropriate understandings of the dangers that could be found online, and they felt comfortable raising the issues. You know, if they countered, you know, they can raise that to an adult. 
And so by implementing some of these suggested te technology safeguards and developing further age appropriate educational material, the percentage of kids who felt safe online can undoubtedly increase with particular focus on the early commencements of awareness programs, especially for younger kids um, as we go through. So Jake, if you wanna, um, we'll go to the to the, some of the um, recommendations and so forth, but you know, how can parents and teachers and carers, how can they help us uh, manage? How can we help our kids manage through and navigate uh, through this, the daily online interaction that happens? Well, yeah, we've got this all to come now. Key recommendations from us. Uh, tried and tested by us both as well. Uh, I'm sure if you're watching this, you've got kids, um, whatever stage they are at, uh, any help is always there. And I always think that it's funny when my friends say to me, like, how do you know what you're doing as a parent? And I go, it's a secret, but I don't. Okay, that, that's it. Like, anyone who's got like kids younger than me, they think I know more than them. Look, we're still trying and testing it. And one of the trying times we're in at the moment is learning about the internet, smartphones, devices, that our kids are growing up with devices as pacifiers in some cases, okay? The amount of times you probably go to a restaurant and you look around and you'll see a whole family on their phones and they're not interacting. And that's the time when they should be interacting, right? Mm. And so... The main thing is, is being open with your kids. I really do find that there's no too early time to do that. Yeah. And so ensuring your kids have the right cybersecurity protection comes with lots of different ways. You can talk about putting apps uh, and, and security on those devices, but that's probably for a bit later on. I think you wanna start with the parental controls if possible, you know, without the arguments, of course. So time online, uh, screen time kind of thing. So you might think, right, I don't want my kid on their tablet for say more than an hour. You can go and set it to, to turn off after an hour. If it just shuts down, you might actually just prolong the argument for when an hour later, you might be able to get your, your jobs done and things like that around the house. But an hour later, it just turns off. It just erupts into, uh, I want my tablet back. And we've probably all been there. And so it's about the discussion. I find you know, giving them the warnings, if that hour is what you're going to give them, you say after half an hour, you're halfway through. If you've got 10 minutes left, it's 10 minutes left. Yeah. I find that really does help. That makes them realize it's coming out of it. But what I also find is if it goes on too long, especially my daughter, she goes too far in her device. She changes her mood. Her attitude can change. I find this more with TV and especially with YouTube, which it, it's just the endless scroll of doom, right? Uh, it still happens on the smart TV. They just yep. go next, next. Oh, I don't like this. I've only watched 10 seconds of it. Must be rubbish. Next, next. You know, to us, older people, this is crazy when we'd have one TV show, what, once a week for half an hour, you miss it, that's it. You know, these people are, if they're not entertained in 10 seconds, they're gone. It's crazy. So with that, around the moods, it's really, really important to see how, how those moods are. Because if anything, these devices can affect them. If it gets really bad, then it might be worse, such as they're being bullied uh, they're, or they're reading comments. You know, the, my children will read the comments in YouTube to see what other people are saying about them. Yeah. That can have a negative impact. Because sometimes that might be something that quite nasty, even if it's not direct to them. So it comes down to discussing with them about it. Um, it's my job to talk about security. So I love talking to them uh, about it. But the amount of parents I speak to who just go, I don't know what they're doing. It's just up to them. It gives me a few moments or an hour or however long to do what I want to do. And I don't really know what they're up to. This is just the worst thing anyone can go into. So understanding what can happen. I love what you say about it's like doing the laundry that's a great i'm gonna steal that one actually because it really is it's an ongoing yeah. situation we we need to be laying down the rules about what is possible what can't happen um if they are to send messages to people they don't physically know like someone in their class then they can lose that privilege and they've got to realize it is a privilege they will lose that privilege for a certain amount of time i find that it starts off with like an hour 
And then if, if something bad happens, I'll then say, right, you're losing it for a day and it increases. And there comes a point where they go, okay, I get it. If I lose it again, it's going to be a week. You know, if I take Netflix away for a day, my daughter is good as gold for, for however long afterwards. So she <laughs> does get it that if that goes, oh my gosh. So um, I can't stress enough how being open with it. Yes. So if we go on to the next one, next slide, we've got about how you learn together. Now, this is so important. I speak to loads and loads of parents who, like I said, don't have, a, don't have a clue what their kids are doing, but I see that as an opportunity, especially for, so I'm 40 and I find the parents older than me tend to not want to learn about the smartphone, especially my brother, okay, he's 46. He couldn't give two hoots about what apps his kids have on his phone. Yeah, I asked him if he's worried about online safety. He says, oh yes, of course. You know, the perils and the pitfalls of the internet, terrible. I say, well, do you want to learn about TikTok? Oh, gosh, no. TikTok's for kids, he says. I said, you're falling into the first trap. This is it. This is your opportunity. Download TikTok. He says, I'm 46, Jake. I wouldn't be seen dead on it. I said, no, <laughs> this is amazing. Get it on there. Don't go and share your stupid dances. No one wants to see your dad dancing. But if you go and play around with TikTok, you will realize there are security and privacy um, settings in that app that you can take advantage of. And then you might be able to throw in some little tips for your kids who probably haven't equally looked at the privacy settings. Um, I know apps will come and go, as we've seen, if you remember Pokemon Go, all about geolocation. And these apps will come and go, and they, can, they go so quickly these days, as you're probably aware. They'll arise one week and be gone. But in that week, you might realize that your kids are giving away their location. <laughs> A real danger for them and a real worry for parents. But if parents are one step ahead of the curve and understand that, hey, click this button here and it doesn't give away their location to everyone that follows them, well, that's a bit of a cool little neat trick. And you might find that the kids don't want to share the location. It's not that they didn't, uh, that they actually wanted to go and give away their location to all these strangers. It's just they hadn't looked at them. So by you giving them the tricks, it actually helps. And that's what the learning together is all about. It's so important. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. It's so important. It's so important. My first um, in-app kind of setting experience was uh, in when the iPad first came out, my son was playing a game on it. And he said, after about an hour on it, that's the best game he's ever played in his life. He was, I've never seen him so happy. And the next morning I got online and found a $1,200 in-app purchases that he had made <laughs> while he was in there. Now I, I got my money back, but at the end of the day, you need to get in there and make sure that in-app purchases is turned off, parental oh controls God, yeah. is turned on, all these things. So get in it with them together and learn. We both learned out of that. I couldn't be mad at him. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't know I what he was doing. Like quicker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But that's a painful mistake. Yeah, I've, I've read about this. I love the fact you got the money back. I've spoken to many people who go, God, I've never checked. And they're the ones that are thinking, gosh, it's been too long. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, just, it's a dangerous time. But yeah, put that pin code. Please don't make it your birthday. They know it. Um, put that <laughs> pin code on there that stops any purchasing. Um, yeah, it will save you um, a few pennies. Now, if we go to the next one. Yes. It's about, so online does not mean online harm. So if you can learn and explore together, you can find that it's not all bad on the internet. And again, I speak to parents who are so scared of it. They don't know what to do. They, and like I said, they don't know what their children are doing, but they still put their head back in the sand and hope it might not happen. And then they hear the stories, because let's face it, the, the terrible stories make the press. And we then all start to worry about what, what are our children doing and what could happen to them? Will it affect them in the future? It, it's not all that. And it's sad to think that some people might worry so much that they don't want their children to be on it. And I think this comes down to choosing when your child has a device. So yeah. I'm in the situation at the moment where my daughter desperately wants a mobile phone and she's nine, going to be 10 in September. And the classic, well, my friends have got one. And I go, yeah, but 
you know, we're all different. And it's a real struggle. And I'm trying to make her understand that there are risks, but I don't know if she's mature enough to see that there is an external world. And if you think about if the if the kids are still believing in Father Christmas, the tooth fairy and so on, then they clearly haven't understood that there is another world outside the family and the school environment. And that's where I don't see a mobile phone sitting, but personally, and this is what it's all about. There's, there's no right or wrong answer about when you go and give these devices to them. But if you like, go with them and l- make them enjoy it and see the wonders of it, then it's yeah. great. And I speak to a lot of people that, that only give them their phones for that hour a day and it's with them. And then it goes back in a drawer and it gets locked away. That's another way of, of getting them used to it because it will increase. But there's a lot of peer pressure and I get that. There's always going to be someone else who's got the latest iPhone, probably a TV in their room, and you name it, every gadget under the sun. And even I'm jealous of that person. But <laughs> th- this is one of those, those, those problems that, hey, we all did as a kid. I remember saying, well, Jim down the road, he's got a really cool bike. Mom, can I please stop having hand-me-downs from my brother? But these are the pressures that you know, we're now faced with, and they're technological which are difficult to really comprehend, especially if you don't work in that atmosphere and environment. Very true. And there's a lot of, there's a, there's so many good apps for learning that are age appropriate. There are so many um, ways of gaining knowledge and being creative and, and all that, 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 you know, kids take advantage. They're so smart and they're so quick to learn things that, you know, the technology and being online is, is also such a such an awesome benefit. Yeah. Right. So, parental and school mediation of children's internet usage. Now, this is what um, I was alluding to earlier. We've actually got some stats here. So, if I just read that, it, a significant majority of kids surveyed, nearly ninety four percent, reported that a trusted adult had discussed online safety with them. The majority of eighty eight percent of kids also said there were rules of some kind in place at home around internet usage. This is great. This is what we want to see, people having those rules rather than the, I'm busy, and let's face it, we all are, and it's very easy to go and do that. But the rules in place, they set the, the skeleton idea, the backbone behind what is safe. Otherwise, it'll just be a free for all and all things can go wrong. But this is where it comes down to time. So, Treat it like you would treat anything that you spend time with your kids do. The spelling test in the week, uh, homework, um, absolutely anything, even just playing sport with them. It's just another one of those vital things that we have to desperately do um, because it is going to be a life skill. It's going to be part of their life forever. Back when I was a kid, no one was thinking about the internet and I had to learn about the internet in my late teens. But now we these kids are looking up at the parents and the teachers to learn about it and if the kids are knowing more about it than our age group then it's just going to be that free for all and we don't want to go that way that's right and the and the peer to peer learning is also really powerful i mean i've got uh two 8 year olds and a an 11 year old and and they still do their homework together they do this kind of peer learning um really to give that approach to support and they know what the rules are and that kind of thing. So then they support each other and hold each other accountable at the same time, yeah. which is, is annoying. I'm gonna, not going to lie because they say they tell on each other and, and I end up being the police, Jake. <laughs> you know how it goes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> this is an interesting question. Again, I've kind of mentioned it a little bit already. When to start with smartphones? It, I think it's different for everyone, uh, probably different in different countries. Um, I know some kids that have got them from three, four years old, probably probably because they are hand-me-downs from their parents and they're thinking, well, you know, it was sitting in a drawer. It saves me buying a device for them later on or whatever. But the smartphone, it's a wonderful device, but it's the controls on it that I think are really important. You know don't go putting a SIM card in that phone for a long time. So get get them used to the phone first 
maybe even a phone with apps that don't need the internet. You can turn the internet off. I've got those um, apps on my kids' tablets that don't need the internet to run because it's just a game on there. And that can be really helpful Um, because the smartphone, let's not forget that the, let's call it the primary function of it is to contact people via the phone. That's a network that can go all over the world and same with the internet functionality of it. And that's where the dangers can come, but there's no right or wrong answer with this. Um, People will always ask it, but what I have noticed it's getting younger. There's got to be an age where it it, it can't go any lower, but um, maybe we're there now. Um, you know, 10 years ago, it was probably uh, in the teens, uh, whereas now let's probably suggest it's pre-teen that they're starting to to want to do it. And they're looking at us parents. I hate it when my kids are come in chatting and I'm working on my phone. I, I do probably 50% of my work on my phone. So I'm there on it and they're walking in and I'm thinking, all they ever see is my attention looking down. And then they want to, particularly my daughter, she wants to then play with a phone. She's got a pretend one. And she loves going around going, yeah, yeah, sorry, just chatting to my friends. I laugh, but uh, it, it's true. And it's mimicking, right? And they're this, mimicking, this, yeah. A, a, a natural thing for kids to do. They see us, we're on our phones. And what we're doing is saying, you can't have one of these. And what they're thinking is, well, why not? It, you've got one. That's a fair question. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. And when they start to, to work that out, you know it's not far away. And it will happen yeah. at some point. Yeah, your kids, Jake, are at the age where they're, you know, getting ready to, you know, cognitively be able to understand risk, consequences, yeah. you know, interaction, the bigger world picture, and really knowing that's a powerful, powerful device. But I think younger than that, they they see it as a toy. Yeah. Um, and so that's fine. My kids all have a tablet. That's and that's what they use. They don't have a phone. Um you know, and when they're 13, they can get, they can get a phone and that's kind of the rule here. Um, but again, my kids will come to me and say the same as yours. My friends at school have a phone and I go, well, what's their phone number? Are you going to call them? Right. You know, what's your contact list look like? And, and they go, well, what do you mean? So they don't, they don't, they don't get it yet. So, um, so again, I, I agree. It's, it's the same. It's, it's really no, no real answer except for, you know, your own parental choice, I suppose. Yeah. And then going on from that social media, now social media, they, they do have ages that they say you've got to be minimum. I do they find do. that people don't follow those rules because I think TikTok is 16. I think, do you know what? I think WhatsApp's even 16, right? But right. it's probably the first app uh, kids will download once they are allowed Uh, a smartphone with internet capability because they can then contact friends chat 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 and and i think these age ranges that they're saying uh, that they are right for they're probably to cover themselves but it's down to parents and if more and more parents disobey these given rules then it just gets younger and younger but social media opens up the world and it is pretty scary for what can happen. And so this is what it comes down to, spending time with your kids whilst they're on it, whatever age, seeing what they're up to and seeing how they interact with other people. Yeah, and once it's up there, it's up there. There's no deleting it off of the internet. And I think that 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 big ripple, and you'll see, you know, if you're on Facebook or other apps where they go, we're testing to see how far this, this post can go around the world. Yes, and how quickly it goes through the world. And that these these are good lessons for kids to know. Look, when you put your stuff up there, I did all my crazy stuff in the 20s. There was no internet. And I am so happy there was no social Thank media. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think it's an important lesson for young, young, young teenagers and, you know, and young adults to think about that. Yep. On a side note, I just want to say, I work with a lady who came to me and said, Jake, I heard you can hack into accounts. And I went, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? And she said, uh, there are some embarrassing images of me on the internet. Um, can you delete them? And I said, uh, you can probably do it yourself. It's going to be tough. But like I say, once it's on the internet, it stays there. And she's like, well, they're on my MySpace account. You might remember the good old days of MySpace. MySpace. Wow. I said, okay, um, just log into it, delete them. After a while, 
Google will stop seeing them. She goes, yeah, I don't know the password and I don't have the email address, I don't own the email address anymore that gets me into it. And I said, all right, give me a few minutes. So um, uh, once I downloaded 2 billion passwords and usernames and uh, had a little play around and found her email address and I found one of her passwords that had been compromised. It was her name, by the way, uh, which was hilarious, with a number on the end. And I said, was this your password? She said, I, th- I think it was. I typed it in. I got back into MySpace. I deleted the images. And now when you Google her name, you don't see her trying to drink three bottles of beer at once, not wearing too many clothes at university. So yeah. it really does go to show that people don't think about what goes on the internet will be there pretty much forever. And it's a dangerous place retrospectively to look back on. And password management is another topic for another another webinar. <laughs> that's a whole new webinar altogether. <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> Very good. So, um, wow, this is it. Recognizing bullying and uh, hurtful behavior. Now, this is yep. difficult. Because these are the keep, these are the these are the three things for yeah, for how you can be proactive, going. right? Yeah. Yeah. So kids don't always open up when they are being bullied, or they'll show it in different ways. They'll shout at you and so on, and uh, and you think, what is wrong with you today? And oh, it it's so tough to step step back, like you say, of being proactive and think, just a minute, what is going on? What could it be? It might be the last thing on your mind that is connected to a a device that's in the house back in our days oh. what bullying was left at the school gates probably very rarely would be taken home with you now it's 24 7 for some of these children which is damaging and, and they're connected they're they're attracted to the the lights and the endorphins that these devices give like a moth to a flame and it'll never go away so that's right no... yeah go, go ahead <laughs> All right, just knowing what kind of response or support is appropriate for the person in need. I think that, yeah. that's so it's subjective to your child. And of course, as a parent, you, you know your child the best, but this yep. might be a switch, a change in how they are. Um, and like I say, it could be the last thing on your mind. It could be coming through the device. Yeah, it's always checking in on, on kids' moods and also just you know, having a discussion. I always find that with my um, older kids, my teenagers, I have a conversation with them when I'm in the car because there's no eye to eye contact. There's no threat. It's a casual discussion. You can kind of bring it up. They're out, they're looking out the window or in, they might be embarrassed or they might cry, but they're not crying in front of me. And I think that's a, that's a, that might be a strategy for some people to, to talk to their kids about if there's a problem with them, you know, with bullying behavior or any other issue that might be going on um, or taking a walk is another way of, of really connecting with, with the teenagers at, at that specific age. Um, and really, you know, knowing what kind of response or support is needed um, is, you know, is your intuition as a parent, right? Just like you, just like you said, you, you know, your kids better than anyone early at the end of the day. And fostering empathy is key, right? So instead of, you know, hey, we talked about this, you need to da-da-da-da, you, you take more empathetic, hey, tell me what's going on. I'm really curious to know what's happening with you. So more of that kind of approach, and you'll find that they'll open up more than yeah. expected. Yeah. The ultimate can of worm scenario. And suddenly yeah. you're there thinking, oh, my gosh, I wish I could just close this all up again. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's right. So, but, so on this, you know, we, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say on this particular topic. So we've got a really great resource um, available here in Australia, which is our Safer Kids Online website. And, um, and you can go onto the website and this is really good because there's a section for teachers. There's a section for parents. There's a section for kids, older kids and younger kids. There's games, there's videos, there's cartoons, there's tutorials, and um, and there's Jake featured in his vlogs um, that he's put up around a lot of these topics that you can listen to and share with your kids. 
So I've actually had a couple of um, of the younger kids come in and and play the games and look at the videos and and they they know this website very well. And they've also introduced it to the school and the school really likes it as well because it's something that some of the teachers can use in in the technology classes and so and so on. So did you want to say more about the Safer Kids Online initiative and what you said? That's it. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you pretty much nailed it. It, it is great and, and it's growing. I like to to see so many schools in the UK, in fact, are using this as a resource. But uh, it's not just for kids. And this is the main point I make to parents. When they hear that we've got this wonderful resource, say for kids online, they go, oh, that's really good for the kids. And then ah, back to the jobs. And I go, no, no, wait, wait, wait. This is for you as well. And they, they go, what? And what do you mean? I said, there's so much information that parents need and can go and find it holds it in that one place. It's so important that, yes, the kids know about it, but the parents, I can't stress enough, need to know more um, and make it an enjoyable experience, not to find it scary. And I think if I can teach my mum, who's 75, uh, how to use, well, I've, I've had her on Snapchat before. That was hilarious. Seeing all those filters pop up on her face, it actually, well, literally blew her eyes out because that was one of the filters but it just goes to show you can teach anyone anything uh if the resources are there and in this wonderful environment then that's a fantastic resource please go and check it out yeah very good and that um that leads us to um our q a session and and one of the questions that has come in is around as a cybersecurity and kids safety experts what what tools of, or products does he set? What, what can we provide to parents and teachers? And so Safer Kids Online is, is definitely the key landing spot for, for them. You know, as far as uh, products go, you know, ESET offers security for um, all devices and all operating systems. Um, and so you can check that out on our website, eset.com.au. Um, and then based on your survey, this is the second question. Did you see any differences between younger kids versus older ones? So under and above 10 years, for example. Um, we did not um, categorize the responses by age, um, interestingly, but I would say that the average age of those who participated was between the ages of eight and 10. So the majority of the responses fell in that. Now, what the way that we did this survey was um, we did it via um, an online survey and we gave away a Nintendo Switch. And if you were a kid and it was Christmas, everybody wanted Nintendo Switch. We got an incredible response um, from that. And but the average age really fell within that within that range. And then the third question is, how different are safety tips for the kids using laptops versus mobile devices? including mobile apps? Hmm, that's a tough one. But I'd say that's not too different. Maybe a bit more on understanding geolocation settings on mobile apps. That can be hmm. scary that some kids could be monitored. Uh, the amount of kids I know, well, I say kids, probably late teenagers, that share their uh, location with their friends voluntarily um, to do with like share my, well, find my friends. So on iPhone, it's find my, and it used to be called find my friends. I think Android has got the same thing. And then they forget about it. I know that some people have put their location settings on to share it all the time. Maybe they then fall out with their friend or, or break up with the partner that's also able to see where they are. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's quite scary when they're suddenly monitored and followed. So mm. you don't necessarily get that so much on laptop, but the same principles are still there. It's about privacy. We really want to keep a tight lid as much as possible on privacy because once the data is out there, other things such as your username, uh, your address and so on, that can't change so easily, that can be out there for good. So it's understanding what data to give away, what permissions to grant, mm. Uh, as soon as you get an app, it will say, ask app not to track, for example. Um, that's a really important thing for people to understand. That we want to minimize that amount of tracking. That's right. Yep. And also forms. When you fill out forms, 
typically more on the on the laptop. Just be really cognizant of the information you sh you're sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people use one particular web uh, or sorry email address that they use for only online forms so that they can keep the spam and all that in, in a separate account. Um, so that might be a good tip. Yeah, that's great. I, I always say to people, if they can do that for forms and shopping online, yeah. you'll really notice that that one gets all the rubbish. And then your main email address stays pretty clean and doesn't really end up using the junk folder because, let's face it, no one else ends up knowing about it. So really good That's one. exactly right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I've only got four friends, so they only email me. <laughs> <That's Yeah. right. laughs> Very good. All right. So, um, all right. Are there any other questions anybody wants to ask on the chat? I think we're all good. Yeah. Very good. Well, well we great. can wrap it up. And yeah. um, and obviously, everyone, if you're keen to get in touch with us, there's our um, our email address and also our website. So come and check us out. And everybody stay safe and keep those kids protected. Yeah. And if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter, it's Jake underscore more UK on Twitter. I'm always talking about how you can stay safer online, uh, whether it's be to do about kids, families, businesses, you name it, um, all things cybersecurity. But um, just would like to say thank you to Kelly. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you from the other side of the world. Thank um, you, Jake. I can get on with my day now. <laughs> Very good. We'll go, we'll go get on with our evening and we'll look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.